Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery again. Part four of our Cultural Revolution Overview. A free public service from all of us here at the China History Podcast. As we begin part four, Chairman Mao has already silenced his detractors within an inch of their lives. And by the time Mao stands before a million admirers at this first big rally of the Cultural Revolution on August 18th, 1966, the whole mass movement is off and running. At this point, if anyone had any second thoughts about what was about to happen, they kept it to themselves. This was terra incognita as far as this founding generation of the PRC leaders were concerned. For all intents and purposes, China, beginning with the cities, was taking a time out to engage in revolution and practice class struggle. After most leaders and cadres saw that Mao wasn't kidding around, they jumped right onto that departing bandwagon and acted like cheerleaders for the movement. Everyone had to be involved in this thing, either on one side or the other. And even those who were all on board, they still had grave doubts about turning all the young Red Guards loose and encouraging them to carry out no-holds-barred class struggle to root out revisionists, capitalist rotors, and any anti-party, anti-Mao elements, wherever they could be found. This is the order that went out. The order went out this way, using the 16 points, the charter for the Cultural Revolution. Now, those in authority had to be careful to strike the precise balance of encouraging the Red Guards to smash the four olds, but they also had to make sure not to carry it too far where order and society would break down. The 16 points did say in so many words, you know, do not cross certain boundaries. Well, what was about to happen went so above and beyond what was intended. I don't know, did Mao intend for it to be like this? However, the call to rebel, struggle, and smash was meant to go out. The way it was heard seemed loud and clear. To the Red Guards and Cultural Revolution opportunists, not only was this going to be easy, it was going to be fun and entertaining and self-satisfying in a whole number of ways. The Red Guards embraced Mao's words and, what is there to say, all hell broke loose. When you hear about the horrors of the Cultural Revolution, when you read all these works of fiction and nonfiction that Concern the Cultural Revolution, books like uh, Zhang Rong's uh, Wild Swans, Jiang Chili's Red Scarf Girl, An Chi Min's Red Azalea, and a, and a hundred others in English and Chinese. There were so many stories that were terrifying and tragic. Could have been you or me. Suddenly you faced the horror that a bunch of kids could legally break into your house, pull you out of your home, and onto a stage in front of Thousands of onlookers, maybe your neighbors, people you knew, and everyone is screaming for blood. And in front of everybody, you could face a a physical and mental beating that sometimes killed people. And if they wanted to find some way to humiliate you, anything was fair game. And even if it was something that might scar you for decades, no, no one took a second thought whether to do it or not. People got roughed up in the most traumatizing ways, and so many were led to suicide. Your entire life could be ravaged in a moment. And all the while, as you were led away to face an uncertain struggle session on some makeshift stage, your place of residence could be raided, and anything that fell under the far-reaching umbrella of the four olds was smashed, burned, or looted, whatever. And if they wanted to, Red Guards could have you sent down to go back to your village where your ancestors came from before liberation, or even a hundred years ago. Almost 2% of the population of Beijing faced getting uprooted from their homes and sent out of the city. When anyone asks me what was so bad about the Cultural Revolution, that was it. If you fell into any number of categories of people, you were fair game to be taken down. During these two terrible months of August, September 1966, it happened 33,695 times just in Beijing alone, and in Shanghai, a place, you know, where more people had even more nice stuff, 84,222 homes of people who fit the bill had to endure this terror of a Red Guard home invasion. And in Shanghai, what happened, this, this was just during a period of a little more than a couple weeks, 
gold, silver, jade, any valuables were fair game. Didn't matter if your great grandma had something that had been handed down to you from her great grandma from the time of Kangxi. In an instant, a family memento was destroyed or confiscated for someone else to hand down one day to their progeny. Tons and tons of gold and silver was looted from people's homes all over. Kang Sheng, by the way, an avid art collector of the highest order, he cleaned up during these early days of the four olds. His agents kept their eyes open for any good paintings, scrolls, rare books, and whatnot. And let me say, although a lot of people survived thanks to their relationship with Zhou Enlai, even Premier Zhou couldn't save everyone. Yeah, if you were someone who might see eye to eye with whatever Liu Shaoqi or Deng Xiaoping might say or think, first came the knowledge that something not good was about to go down. Then the next thing you knew, one person after another, day in, day out, you'd hear about this one getting it or that one getting it, and you knew your day was coming, and no matter how hard you might try to be totally on board with this cultural revolution thing, when August, September 1966 came along, if you had any kind of skeleton in your closet, if it were found out, you were in for a rough time, possibly facing the kind of treatment that I just described. Or you might face death or the death of loved ones. Chairman Mao was thinking, if you turn the heat up all the way and turn these Red Guards loose, they'd rid the whole party of any revisionists and anyone even contemplating taking the capitalist road. What Mao didn't think of was that, as things progressed, it was also the perfect environment to go settle scores with whoever you had a beef with, in your government department, your factory, your school, your, your school's administration, throughout the universities, in your own neighborhoods, local party committees. Almost everyone was vulnerable in one form or another. In August, September 1966, it was a scary time, and this was when the Cultural Revolution was at a fever pitch and all the most horrific excesses that you've all heard about started to happen, and in a big way. Chairman Mao made it loud and clear. He didn't mince words about what could or couldn't be done. So now that all the Red Guards had carte blanche, they went to work, learning revolution by making revolution. Now, poor Liu Shaoqi, he hadn't been taken down yet. Mao keeps him to lead the charge against his one-time comrades and allies. So following the first big rally in Tiananmen on August 18th was a rally the very next day in Shanghai. There followed another rally, the second one in Beijing, on August 31st. This one was emceed by Jiang Qing, so she got to be the center of attention, and I bet she was in hog heaven, standing up there on Tiananmen Gate, you know, of course, you know, people were there for her husband, but she got to stand before them and get them excited and get a chance to bask in Mao's glory. And one of the funny things that happened, Lin Biao, he was always a total wreck because of his many illnesses, you know, most of them imaginary. He didn't like to be outdoors. And if any of the stories are true, and mind you, he isn't here to defend himself and he had a lot of enemies, but it's said the feel of the wind blowing on against his skin just freaked him out. He didn't like that. Water, too. He was afraid of water, or at least the sight of the water, you know, like the open sea. Anyways, he had all these supposed phobias, and it's only natural that the history books mention these things. So you'd think he'd hate these huge outdoor Red Guard rallies. But in fact, Lin Biao loved these things. It was like, once they all got bitten by that bug, once you got the taste of waving to a million people all screaming and getting caught up in the moment and, you know, being who they were, top government leaders. Who can resist that feeling? So Lin Biao, he was always very animated at these things. On September 15th, there was another big rally in Beijing. The usual massive crowd. This one was emceed by none other than the so-called godfather of the Cultural Revolution, Kang Sheng. Normally, he was very laid back, sinister, hang in the shadows, do your worst damage from behind the scenes kind of guy. But here he was, right up in front, center stage, 
right at the podium, making speeches, waving to the crowd, you know, the Red Guards cheering and screaming out their slogans and showing their approval. Then came the National Day Rally, the fourth one. This one was a little scary. Uh, Mao came up with the great idea to go do a meet and greet with the crowd, which, you know, for National Day was about one and a half million strong. Bad idea, it turned out to be. The, the entourage driving the leaders to Tiananmen Square was totally overwhelmed by the massive crowd. Just picture the Beatles at the height of Beatlemania, just driving out onto Times Square in New York in a limo on a Saturday night. Well, that's what happened in Mao. And the security detail that day barely got the chairman and his fellow famosas out of Tiananmen Square alive. After they were all safely inserted inside the Forbidden City behind locked gates, it's said that Mao exclaimed, we're going to carry the great proletarian cultural revolution through to the end. If it comes down to it, We'll all go down together. By November, the last of the eight rallies was held. 200,000 people a day had been rotating in and out of Beijing. They, they rode the trains for free, and all the logistics were left to the PLA and the Ministry of Railways. A lot of people were on the go. You had all these people from all points, north, south, east, and west in China, taking the Hajj to Beijing to go attend these rallies and visit where the center of the world was. Well, their world, at least. And not just Beijing. The Red Guards traveled all over the country. For the people of Beijing, this was a massive disruption, as you can imagine. At its worst point, there were three million more people in Beijing than the usual, at the time, 7.7 million. So imagine the strain on resources for hygiene, for eating, for sleeping... There was a lot of hooliganism and destruction of public property that added to the woes of city officials trying to blend into the Cultural Revolution and also at the same time keep the wheels from falling off the bus. You know, when you're in your 20s, shoot, you could bunk down almost anywhere. It ain't no thing. The unexpected consequences of so many millions on the go all the time led to all kinds of unexpected tragedies. The PLA made sure there were food rations for everyone. And mind you, it wasn't anything to write home about. There wasn't any hong shao rou. Typically, the PLA issued grub for everyone was, you know, for breakfast, you got rice, water, pickles, and a steam bun. Lunch was two steam buns, a dish of cabbage, and maybe some pork. These hundreds of thousands of people converged on Beijing, and they were met at the bus stations and train stations by a Red Guard reception center, you know, sort of like the uh, USO at all the U.S. airports. And there they'd get whatever information they needed about what was going on, you know, and those manning these centers, and they were everywhere, would direct the people, you know, where to go. By the time of the last rally on November 26, 1966, between 11 to 12 million Red Guards had come to Beijing at one time or another and can now go back to their own cities and counties with stories that they saw Chairman Mao and heard him speak. Not everyone went to Beijing, but if you were young, you didn't have any school, and if you had a fraction of wanderlust, your moment had come. Red Guards and anyone caught up in the moment who wanted to go out on an adventure, this was the time. And it was an amazing chance for people who you know, had no chance of ever getting out of their city or village, let alone their province, to hit the road. They could get, you know, three squares a day, free travel and accommodation, and the government picked up the tab. And the cult of Mao was burning white hot at this time. So the most popular destinations were, you know, the revolutionary meccas of Yan'an, Sunyi, Jinggan and Shaoshan, and any place that could you know, brag of some past association with the life of Mao Zedong. In China today, there are a million diaries and memories filled with all the stories of this time. Some romantic, some sad, some tragic. If you were born, say, in the years immediately after the end of World War II and, you know, around the Korean War, you were the perfect Red Guard age. 
So between rooting out revisionists and capitalist rotors, learning revolution by carrying out revolution, getting even with your enemies and getting the chance to see the country, there was also this whole business about destroying the four olds. I already mentioned about this with regard to one's personal treasures and mementos from their past. But more than the personal valuables and keepsakes of the Chinese people fell victim to the four olds. China, you know, being a multi-millennia old civilization, had a lot of cultural and historical buildings, temples, works of art, and cultural relics that fell under the broad categories of the four olds. What we saw the Taliban do in March 2001 when Mullah Omar called for the destruction of the Buddhas at Bamiyan, you had the same sort of mentality in China amongst those who were particularly enthusiastic about smashing the four olds. For the Taliban, they did what they did in the name of Islam. When Buddhist temples and statues were destroyed during the four olds campaign, it was done in the name of Chairman Mao. In such an ancient and historic city as Beijing. At the time, there were 6,843 places that were officially designated by the state as places of cultural and historical interest. About 70% of these places got trashed. Early on, Premier Zhou Enlai saw what could possibly happen, and he did what he could, calling many places off-limits to Red Guards with no exceptions. You know, of course, there was the Forbidden City. No one was allowed to go in. Same thing with the Great Hall of the People, the Diao Yutai, Guest House, various government ministry buildings, all organs of communication stayed in the hands of the party, and no one was allowed to take those over or even go there. But not everything was protected. Thanks to Chen Da and others in the Central Cultural Revolution Group, CCRG, the whole Chu Fu complex in Shandong, the home of Confucius, was completely trashed. Was this China's most sacred ground? Maybe, maybe not. By the time the Red Guards finished with Chu Fu, 929 paintings, 2,700 books, 1,000 stone steles, and 2,000 graves were destroyed, desecrated, and burned. Those Red Guards sure taught Confucius a lesson. And you remember Haigre? Wuhan wrote the play that sort of lit the fuse to the explosions that were all going off now. Haigre's grave on Hainan Island was dug up and desecrated and destroyed. Books in the libraries everywhere were destroyed. Public, private, university libraries. I used to be associated with this organization in L.A. called Medical Books for China. A great and giving man, Dr. Jordan Phillips, who passed away in July of 2008. He set up this organization to ship containers and containers of medical books and journals to China to help in the restoration of many of these university medical libraries that were destroyed by the Red Guards during the Cultural Revolution. Government officials all over China had to pick and choose what was fair game to be destroyed in their own towns. If you tried to protect too much, then you found yourself on the wrong end of a struggle session. So all these officials had to figure out what was okay for the Red Guards to trash and what was hands-off. And as the Red Guards smashed the four olds, attended these rallies, traveled throughout the country, all those who could be classified in one form or another as Mao's opponents, in spectacles everywhere, all these party officials from Peng Zhan, Peng De Huai, Bo Yi Bo, anyone, all the way down to the smallest local official. They went through a whole gauntlet of humiliations as they faced the fury of the Red Guards and everyone else out for a little entertainment, courtesy of the CCRG. You see, if you were going to go after some party big fish, you needed the approval of the CCRG first. Mao called a meeting in October to sort of get a time stamp on the Cultural Revolution, discuss how it was going so far, and how to keep and maintain the momentum. In what became known as the Central Work Conference of October 9th to 28th, it was here where Liu Shaoqi and Deng Xiaoping had to stand before everyone 
and criticize themselves, show mounds of contrition, and basically say if they had only more strictly followed Mao's thought and consulted him more often, these mistakes they committed never would have happened. They really had to take it full in the face as far as you know, how they handled the matter of these work teams back in June and July. Starting from right about here, Liu and Deng became fair game to be attacked by name. See, up until now, at least out on the streets and outside the Central Committee, although they were attacked regularly, it had only been obliquely. Everyone knew who the criticism was directed against, but no one was saying their names or daring to write their names in big character poster attacks. That was until now. At the end of 1966, on December 9th, came the 10 points on industry that basically invited all the workers to join in on the Cultural Revolution and to parrot what their student comrades had been doing for almost half a year. Then a week later came the 10 points on rural villages that did the same thing to everyone else out in the countryside. So with these two Zhongfas, or central party directives, the workers and peasants were turned loose and invited to carry out the same kind of rebellion violence and destruction that had already been carried out by the student Red Guards. So as the extremely tumultuous year in China of 1966 comes to an end, Mao has now unleashed what amounts to the entire population of China to stop everything they're doing and just carry out revolution and class struggle. Oh man, in theory this looked good, at least to Mao. Chairman Mao had faith that this was all going to work out well just like he envisioned. Others saw the beginning of the end of China. What happened was, you know, something in between. An out-of-control Red Guard movement had its uses to those in the CCRG. The Red Guards always proved to be excellent surrogates for the CCRG members who would use the young students to go do their dirty work. One early example of this concerns the 61 Renegades, you might recall this group from the Bo Yi Bo episode. Bo was amongst this group of 61 young communists who in 1928 were captured by the nationalists and thrown into a KMT prison in Tianjin. To make a long story short, Liu Shaoqi took charge of this matter back in the 1930s and was somehow able to negotiate with the KMT authorities to get the release of all 61. But in order to secure their release in 1936, they all had to forswear their allegiance to the communists and communism, you know, and say a bunch of negative things. A radical Red Guard detachment in Tianjin uncovered this matter and brought it to the attention of the CCRG. Some within the CCRG, most of all Kangsheng, were delighted to obtain this quality red meat brought to them by these Tianjin Red Guards. They knew a good thing when they saw it. Amongst these 61 renegades or traitors were guys like Bo Yi Bo. So not only was this matter of the 61 renegades a good way to take a huge swipe at Liu Shaoqi at his most vulnerable, but it was also a chance to knock down known capitalist rotors like Bo Yi Bo, who had been involved in China's finances and economic planning since day one. Kangsheng, Jiangqing, and their enablers were able to twist this whole thing, you know, regarding what Liu Shaoqi did to get these guys freed. You know, on the surface of it, he made a bunch of promises to the KMT, you know, that he never intended to keep and, you know, made his guys sign these documents or whatever. And the bottom line, they were all freed and lived to fight on for the revolution. But Kangsheng, he was a clever guy. He was able to show that all along these 61 were no good, and the most no good of all was Liu Shaoqi, who used his power not only to get them released, but also to place many of them in very sensitive positions of power in the party, government. In short, you you get the picture. And for this reason, the brave Bo Yi Bo, if you remember from episode 80, was struggled against at Workers' Stadium, but didn't back down in the face of these accusations. Well, you know, the matter of the 61 renegades was simply another nail in Liu Shaoqi's coffin, which already had hundreds of nails in it already. 
In early 1967, it was looking like it was only a matter of time before the final nail got pounded in. Already in January, even a place such as Zhongnanhai wasn't even safe. Red Guards were allowed to go in, harass the leaders, and paint pro-Mao slogans on their residences and paste Datsu Falls all around, denouncing them for, you know, whatever they felt like. Even the most sacred of sacred cows, Zhu De, even Marshal Zhu De, Mao's oldest comrade from the very beginning, the founder of the PLA, even he was pushed around and harassed. Deng Xiaoping wasn't faring too well either, but we all know what happened to him and when he, what he went on to do after the Cultural Revolution was over. But it was right about now, though, in early 1967, that someone dug up his post-Great Leap Forward 1962 quip that basically said, you know, it doesn't matter what color the cat is as long as it catches mice. So he got nailed for that, you know, among a hundred other things. Both Liu and Deng were under terrible pressure. Their lives were completely in Mao's hands. They were manhandled and humiliated, of course, but no one could put the knife in until Mao gave the thumbs up or the thumbs down. Liu and Deng were the two biggest fish, and what ultimately happened to them was purely for Mao Zedong and no one else to decide. Early 1967, this is when all the endless denunciations began to gather momentum. This was the terrible period when anyone who was caught up in the dragnet got dragged unceremoniously on stage, kicked in the ass in front of a crowd of 10,000 screaming and hysterical locals. You know, the dunce hat would be put on, the sign around the neck, and the iconic props of the Cultural Revolution, you know, they all came out. And as I said, many died during the carrying out of these atrocities. If you were lined up on the wrong side of Mao, this was your fate. If you had something in your past that was dug up or if someone ratted you out for some remark you made eight years ago, this was possibly your fate too. This was a golden time to get back at any and all officials, colleagues, or enemies who weren't popular or who were considered, you know, not revolutionary enough. Yet all these various Red Guard groups, some were elite groups that had access to the CCRG, some not so well connected, but they were extremely well organized. And and when the CCRG top brass sat in their Diaoyutai villas and schemed about, you know, who should be next, all they had to do was whisper in the ears of any number of Red Guard organizations to go get, you know, so-and-so and and give it to him good. And the next thing you know, you know, he was up in front of 50 or 100,000 people with a sign around his neck getting airplaned for his alleged crimes against Chairman Mao. These were the days with Jiang Qing thoroughly in charge of the levers that controlled the flow of art and culture into the lives of the Lao Bai Xing. The only stuff anyone got to see were the revolutionary operas and movies that did only one thing, glorify Mao and everything he stood for. These were the days when, if you were a woman and you knew what was good for you, you wore flat shoes, a green red guard style uniform with matching jacket and baggy trousers, and of course, the same kind of army cap that Mao wore. Then you finished off your ensemble with Las Dos Necesidades, a Mao badge of some sort, and your own copy of Lin Biao's great work to the glorification of his benefactor, The Little Red Book. 1967, the year of the sheep, the most powerful people in China were Mao, Lin Biao, Zhou Enlai, and the elite of the CCRG. This was Chen Boda, Kang Sheng, Jiang Qing, Wang Li, Guan Feng, Qing Ban Yu, Zhang Chunqiao, and Yao Wenyuan. The CCRG at this point, early 1967, was determining policy for all of China. The scope of their authority knew almost no bounds because they were controlled by Mao and derived their power, prestige, and authority from their relationship with them. So they had their hand on almost every lever in the government. The functioning bureaucracies of China say what you want to say about them, but they no longer worked and had been taken over in this seizure of power by the CCRG. Things really went from bad to worse once the military got thrown into the fray. 
after it became okay to go after capitalist rotors in the army, all-out civil war erupted. You had Red Guard units fighting against local army units and garrisons. It's right about now where the Red Guards start splitting up into factions and began to savage each other and carry out all kinds of outrageous acts to you know, prove their revolutionary stripes and curry favor with the CCRG. One of the most obvious splits took place between the initial Red Guard groups, you know, who were all, I guess you could call them the elite in a way. They were all, you know, the Tsinghua and Peking University types from and from other leading universities of the day. They provided the initial leadership in the movement. But later on, when things really took off in August 1966, after everyone else all over the place had been invited to jump on the Red Guard bandwagon, these new Red Guards began to challenge the original elite Red Guards of the movement. The stories go on and on forever about these heady days and all the crazy and outlandish things that the Red Guards did to display their commitment and devotion to Mao and you know, the whole revolution. These were the days of Nong Yue Xue Da Jai and Gong Yue Xue Da Qing, when Mao directed everyone in agriculture to learn from the model commune of Da Jai in Shanxi and in industry to learn from the country's greatest oil producer at Da Qing. In February 1967, in a sign that you had to be careful committing your life to a guy like Chairman Mao, he growled loudly at a Politburo meeting on the 10th, where his criticism was directed at Chen Boda and Jiang Qing. First, he pounces on Chen Boda for carrying out activities that tried to split the unity of the Politburo. And then right in front of everyone, he shows his wife, who's boss, when he tells her she's someone who, quote, who has grandiose aims but puny abilities, great ambition but little talent. And he didn't stop there. Right on the heels of the leftists' total and complete seizure of the Shanghai party and government, the two leaders, Zhang Chunqiao and Yao Wenyuan, got called up to Beijing to get a dressing down by the chairman. And it's right about now that another of the great cultural revolution rogues makes his debut onto the national scene. In the next episode, we'll look at Wang Hongwen, a hot-headed, firebrand leftist of a radical, if there ever was one. He was a nobody of a worker who made a lot of noise during a particular incident in Shanghai and got himself noticed and was helicoptered into the inner circles of the CCRG. And I kid you not, towards the end of the Cultural Revolution, he was the number three guy in all of China with only... Mao and Zhou outranking him. So, Wang Hongwen, ladies and gentlemen, we'll look at him next week. He uh, held a 25% shareholding in the Gang of Four with Jiang Qing, Zhang Chunqiao, and Yao Wenyuan holding the uh, remaining 75% stake. We have so far to go still, but we made some progress today. We're into 1967, which my descriptions can hardly do justice. The Cultural Revolution these days is a pretty well-documented period in modern Chinese history. All those red guards of yesteryear are today in their late 50s and well into their 60s. So next time we're together, we'll see how this whole thing immediately spun out of control. And when Mao could have taken his hand off the throttle, he just goes and revs the engine. And now it's not even a year later and you have red guard factions galore beating on each other, slowing down the wheels of progress, affecting the economy and total daily life in China. The army is not in very good shape. And when they get invited into the fray, the fighting gets bloodier and the politics of the period get more complicated. As 1967 progressed, Mao knew this whole thing wasn't working out like he originally envisioned it. It seemed despite everything he did to encourage it, he didn't expect that everything would fall apart like it did and that the Red Guards would all turn on each other, you know, causing more harm than good. So when we resume this Cultural Revolution overview, we'll see Mao starting to think of some sort of exit strategy and turn the heat down a few notches. As the chairman finds out, and like every leader of every political party and nation and on earth figures out sooner or later, when you invite the extremists into your world, anything can happen. And whatever it is, you'll probably live to regret it. 
and so it was in this case. But Mao, he was such a kidder. When he went on the attack against the CCRG leaders in February, he was only doing this to embolden those who were against the acts carried out by the CCRG to speak out, you know, which they did. Chen Yi, Xu Xiangqian, Tan Zhenlin, and others. They thought Mao was coming to his senses, but in a classic Mao move, they fell right into his trap. And before you could say Dong Fang Hong, the CCRG was back in power and badder than ever. And those who spoke up and went against the current, they got nailed. And it was now when Jiang Qing did what she had been no doubt dreaming about doing for the longest time. It was now when she felt secure enough to go after Wang Guangmei, the glamorous and charismatic wife of Liu Shaoqi. And as we'll see in the next episode, finally, Liu Shaoqi gets his first taste of physical violence. And when he goes to Chairman Mao one last time and begs for mercy, his old comrade from Hunan turns his back on him, and they never meet again. So that's all I have for you today. This is Laszlo Montgomery, leaving you once again from my very own man cave here in beautiful, sunny, Claremont, California, 91711. I hope you'll join me next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.